the apical window. So again, I, I, I will, we've seen this uh, slide before on the other cardiac sections here, but showing the, uh, the traditional windows or pro-placement positions to insinate the heart. Um, left parasternal, apical, and subcostal we mentioned are the main um, windows uh, that produce the three views that we will talk for the pointy care ultrasound uh, area. We talked about the parasternal long and short axis. We're now going to the apical four and five chamber views. So this is with the ultrasound probe placed ideally over the apex of the left ventricle to obtain uh, two different cross sections or two different views of the left ventricle to allow us to evaluate uh, all of the uh, uh, main cardiac valves outside the pulmonic valve. So these are the views in uh, uh, are, that are used to evaluate tricuspid, mitral, and aortic valves. Notice the key difference between the four-chamber and five-chamber view is that the five-chamber view has a higher um, uh, cross-section of uh, a more anterior cross-section of the heart that allows you to insinate and evaluate the left ventricular alpha tract, aortic valve, and aorta. So how do we attain this view? Again, uh, ideally you want to place the probe uh, at the PMI of the patient, so you identify the PMI if possible. Uh, traditionally, it's often around the 6th or 7th rib space. You're going to have your indicator aiming at the 2 or 3 o'clock position or towards the floor of the bed, so aiming down like this, with the angle again shining through the apex of the left ventricle. Often, we are slightly medial to uh, uh, the, the nipple line, um, around the somewhere between the uh, medial and lateral clavicular borders. The key uh, component of the apical view uh, that is uh, useful when it comes to the point of care uh, setting is the fact that we are now parallel to flow. And so because we are parallel to flow, we are able to get a, an evaluation of the valvular function. You can also determine ventricular and atrial size in this view. However, realize that we are further away from these uh, structures than compared to the parasternal view. So the resolution quality may be slightly impaired uh, compared to the parasternal window. Again, the key component of this is that it allows one to be able to uh, Doppler uh, and use color Doppler to evaluate valvular function because you're now parallel to flow uh, for the four-chamber view, you are parallel for the mitral and tricuspid valves. And when we talk about the five-chamber view, uh, you're now parallel to flow across the left ventricle alpha tract and the aortic valve. This is also the view that we use to evaluate for diastolic function using Doppler ultrasound. And I encourage you to view the module on that. And finally, uh, this is also a, a ideal view to evaluate for RV function because you are able to see the left ventricular chamber alongside the RV uh, for comparison. And so therefore you have a good ability to evaluate differences in size. Fundamentally, it's very important to realize that the RV uh, should never be more than two thirds the size of the LV. So again, this cartoon image here shows the uh, structures that we'd like to see shine through the apex of the left ventricle, allow you to see a good long axis uh, view of the left ventricle uh, along with the right ventricle, evaluate the tricuspid and mitral valves. Here's our ultrasound plane that we're cross-sectioning across. And here is, again, a picture of the ultrasound image that we, that we should see. When the indicator is at the, on the, um, aiming at the 3 o'clock position, and the, that should correspond with the indicator on the ultrasound screen, or the marker for the ultrasound screen being on the right side of the screen, this should be the left ventricular chamber, and this should be the right ventricular chamber. Moving from that view to the five chamber view, we simply are just going to lower our angle with the ultrasound probe to the skin to allow us to insinate and see more anterior structures. And that's what this uh, animation is trying to show us, lowering the uh, ultrasound uh, angle with the skin to allow us to see more anterior structures. And again, what we're able to do with this is now identify the left ventricular alpha tract and aortic valves. So this cartoon image now sees that we have, have now made a uh, more anterior cross-section of the, of, the, of the heart, and that allows us to see the left ventricular alpha tract uh, and the aortic valve. This is the ideal view to evaluate for aortic stenosis uh, and other uh, valve abnormalities such as aortic insufficiency as well.
comparison here showing the four chamber view uh, with the right ventricle, left ventricle here, tricuspid mitral valve, comparing that to the five chamber view where we now have uh, a view of the left ventricle alpha track and the aortic valve. So now it's a brief overview of the apical section and um, we'll now go on to the hands-on demonstration via the simulator of how to obtain this uh, window. All right, so now we're going to talk about the apical window, and uh, the, the goal of the apical window is to have the ultrasound plane shine through the apex of the left ventricle, hence the name of the apical window. To start off, you want to get the apical four-chamber view, so you'll have your indicator aiming at the 2 to 3 o'clock position. Start off, if you can identify the patient's PMI, or really just try to go uh, one or two rib spaces below the nipple line, around the 6th to 7th rib space. Again, with the ultrasound plane, somewhere between that 2 to 3 o'clock position, you want to seed your ultrasound plane in between the rib spaces, and we've done it, we've identified that here. And we've lowered our angle to be able to, identify, to truly get a cross-section of the ultrasound plane through the uh, left ventricle chamber. And so we see the right ventricle on the left side of the screen there, the left ventricle on the right side of the screen with the mitral and tricuspid valve accordingly. Similarly now, if I wanted to go from the apical four chamber view to the apical five chamber view, which means opening up the left ventricle alpha track, what we're going to do is lower our angle with the ultrasound probe with the skin. So you can see here I'm lowering our angle, and by doing that, I'm opening up that left ventricular alpha track to get the aortic valve. So now we see the aortic valve in view by simply lowering the angle of the ultrasound probe. My indicator is still aiming at that 2 to 3 o'clock position, but I've just lowered my angle to get that 5 chamber or LVOT view. Coming back up to the 4 chamber view here, um, this is the, again the ideal view to Doppler and evaluate valve function um, of the aortic and excuse me of the mitral and tricuspid valve and the 5 chamber view is the ideal view to identify uh, flow patterns across the aortic valve. For this module, we'll look at the utility of cardiac ultrasound to evaluate cardiac valvular function. Very important that this module um, should be uh, only viewed after you saw the module on the apical windows because uh, this talk will rely on the basic foundation that we established in that module of the uh, assessment and pro placement of the, uh, to obtain the apical window. So again, just for review regarding that, um, we uh, place the ultrasound probe such that we shine through the apex of the left ventricle. We're aiming at the, which is very quickly again, indicator aiming at the two or three o'clock position, ideally um, uh, around the patient's PMI, really will, will end up being uh, around the, the nipple line, one or two rib spaces below that space um, with the ultrasound probe aiming through the apex of the left ventricle. This again is the cartoon image that we're looking for. It allows us to get true long axis fashions of uh, all four chambers of the heart. Hence the name apical four chamber view. We talked about uh, again about uh, in the apical window uh, uh, module about how you manipulate this uh, proposition uh, by lowering the angle to allow you to see more anterior structures of the heart to obtain the five chamber view. And again, what the uh, this allows us to have to intonate is we are now able to see the left ventricular alpha track and the aortic valve shown here. So four chamber view here, uh, nicely identifying the tricuspid valve, uh, the right ventricle, left ventricle, and the mitral valve. And now by having a more anterior angle with cross section of the heart by lowering the angle of the uh, ultrasound probe with the skin. So going from this motion you're able to intonate the left ventricular alpha track and the aortic valve. So you see here again, just to review the anatomy that we assess for the apical four chamber view. Important um, <clears throat> to realize now for this module, how we're going to be uh, using uh, Doppler ultrasound uh, to evaluate valvular function. Just again, a quick review of uh, continuous wave Doppler. Remember, continuous wave Doppler, as the name says, uh, means that the ultrasound uh, uh, is constantly emitting um, ultrasound signals uh, and constantly receiving, uh, hence the name continuous. Because of this, uh, since it's constantly sending out and receiving um, uh, ultrasound signals, you are able to get a summation 
of all the velocities without any uh, range limitation on what velocities that can be assessed. Only able to get a summation of uh, velocities along this path. So a continuous wave um, will allow you to be able to get a, a summation of all the velocity or flow patterns along that ultrasound plane here. So here, this picture here is trying to show that what we'll get is a summation of all the flow patterns across this. Um, but you will not be able to identify where in this path that velocity signal is uh, originating from. And that's uh, the limitation of continuous wave Doppler. And I encourage you to please uh, review the physics module to get a, a more insight onto this uh, Doppler uh, modality. This is a representation, for example, of a continuous wave Doppler uh, shown through this cartoon here of going across the aortic valve and somebody who has aortic stenosis, you can see this flow acceleration. We are again assuming that this flow acceleration shown here is occurring at the aortic valve, and this is where again we mesh the 2D imaging with the Doppler ultrasound technique. So uh, we do a 2D image of the uh, 2D uh, cardiac ultrasound exam. We visualize a aortic valve that looks calcified and has uh, uh, impaired movement. We use Doppler then to look for flow acceleration, and then we put the two together um, to identify that, in fact, this person has aortic stenosis. Compare that again with the pulse wave Doppler, which allows you to identify a specific uh, velocity signal along this path. However, because of the fact that now that you are determining the sample area that you want to assess, assess the velocities, you are now limited on the velocity ranges that you can assess. And so this is, uh, again, the benefit of pulse wave Doppler of the velocity signal, but at the cost of not being able to have a complete range of velocities to be assessed. And again, I, I encourage you to go back through the physics section to uh, evaluate this concept along with the concept of the Nyquist limit. Uh, key things that we use pulse wave Doppler for as this area is for the evaluation of diastolic um, function by looking at a specific area of mitral inflow patterns. Um, but again, uh, those are, are uh, more advanced topics uh, in the point of care ultrasound section. Notice the signal here, pulse wave looks uh, much more crisp waveform, simply because again, we're identifying an exact location of where the velocity should be accessed. So now let's talk mo which, uh, the, from a point of care setting, uh, what's most used uh, most often for the evaluation of cardiac valves. 2D color uh, imaging. So 2D color imaging, as we talked again about in the ultrasound physics section, is essentially a summation uh, in this color Doppler window of multiple pulse wave Doppler signals. So that's the way to think about um, 2D color, is that it's just a window of multiple pulse wave Dopplers that allows you to see, uh, based on color designation, the direction and intensity of flow. So uh, the ultrasound machine simply does uh, the pulse wave signals and adds a uh, color and a magnitude of that color um, to represent the velocity of that flow. Important to remember the, the, the range of velocities called the Nyquist limit. And when it comes to evaluation of cardiac valves, we want to keep that Nyquist limit at a determined range such that we are able to interpret the images uh, uniformly. And that range is at 50 centimeters per second. And that's an important thing to realize that we need to make sure our Nyquist limit is at the appropriate range such that we are interpreting valve function uh, as per uh, the standard. Also remember um, when you're looking at, co that, at color flow Doppler to think of BART, blue away, red towards to understand the direction of flow. So as we said here, the Nyquist limit should be always kept at uh, 60 centimeters per second. Um, when you use the cardiac phase array probe, it should default to 50 or 60 centimeters per second. And as long as you stay within those range, you can look at this color Doppler pattern as a good representation of how uh, traditional cardiac ultrasound imaging would be used to evaluate that valvular function. But very important, again, you want to make sure that this range of velocities is set at the uh, 60 centimeters per second. Um, threshold and not lowered because if it is lowered you can actually show a 2D uh, color Doppler imaging of uh, worsening potentially that flow pattern uh, simply because you have a lower range and again I encourage you to please evaluate the physics section to understand this concept more but 
the quick um, concept to, to take home on is that you want to make sure that, that when you engage color Doppler to evaluate cardiac valves, that you have the Nyquist limit or the range of velocity shown here uh, to 60. So we'll talk about um, how we look at that color Doppler window to evaluate valvular function uh, in the subsequent slides. But we also want to talk about another mechanism of assessing valvular function which using color Doppler, which is the concept of vena contracta. Vena contracta is the narrowest region of any of a jet that occurs along the orifices of that valve. So anytime you have a regurgitation, notice, if you trace where the origination of that regurgitation is along that uh, valve plane, you can measure that, and that measurement is the vena contracta. Even though um, the uh, measurement of vena contracta is widely used, I would encourage you to, again, always produce a high-quality 2D image you possibly can to get appropriate measurements. And that's the potential error for this, is that very small room for error for falsely increasing or decreasing the measurement, because we're talking about um, measurements within the you know several millimeter range um, to evaluate uh, severity. Uh, and so this is something that, again, requires a very high uh, quality image. So let me just show you a picture here. Here you see this is the mitral valve here. We see the orifices of regurgitation jet right here. And we would measure our vita contracta right along here. This entire path or the narrowest window of the regurgitation jet is that vena contracta. But let's talk about the now breaking down uh, specifically how we would, from a point of care standpoint, evaluate valvular function. Step one, first make sure that you have the best 2D image you possibly can that has the valve structure and um, uh, allows you to see its motion uh, as well as its anatomy as clear as possible. The next step would be to apply the color Doppler window over that valve along with the window being the appropriate size to incorporate the area backflow. So you want to have your color Doppler window to be able to take the entirety of that valve as well as the entirety of the area backflow. Very important to emphasize again at this point that you want to check your Nyquist limit to make sure that it's set at that 60 centimeters per second, which again it should default to in most um, uh, cardiac ultrasound machines that have the phase array probe attached to it. So when it comes to the area of backflow, uh, just to take home this point a little bit to reemphasize this, for example, the mitral valve, you'd have the color Doppler uh, window over the entirety of the mitral valve plus the entirety of the left atrium. For the aortic valve, you'd have it over the entirety of the aortic valve plus the left ventricular outflow tract. For the tricuspid valve, similarly, you'd have the valve along with the right atrium. And then, when we have the Nyquist limit set appropriately, we're simply going to compare the area of the regurgitation jet to the area of the measurement of the area backflow. So simply, uh, we'll show this in subsequent slides, but for the mitral valve, for example, we take a look at how much of that regurgitation jet occupies the left atrium. For the aortic valve, how much of that regurgitation jet occupies the left ventricular outflow tract? And for the tricuspid valve, how much of that regurgitation jet occupies the right atrium? When it comes to the evaluation of stenosis, that's when we would use the uh, continuous wave um, uh, Doppler modality to Doppler across that valve to look for flow acceleration and get pressure gradients. And fifth, if possible, you can, if you have a good high quality image, you can obtain measurements such as the vena contracta. So here, here's a apical four-chamber view. We have the color Doppler window over the mitral valve and the entirety of the left atrium. And we can see, in fact, that if I pause this picture here, that the regurgitation jet occupies the entirety of the left atrium. And so this would be somebody with obvious severe mitral regurgitation. I encourage you, this is in the iBook, but here's the reference range. What we're simply looking for is anything that occupies uh, more than 50% uh, of the left atrial area should um, be uh, a concern for severe uh, regurgitation. Similarly, for the tricuspid valve here, there's a picture here showing that the regurgitation jet is in fact occupying the majority of the uh, right atrium. Exact same measurements uh, for the valuation of tricuspid regurgitation. And here for um, aortic regurgitation, now remember this is the apical five-chamber view. And we're simply looking to see how much of this regurgitant jet 
shown here. Occupies how much of this jet occupies the area of the left intragravel tract. So we're taking a measurement here compared to the measurement of our aortic insufficiency jet. And here you can see that comparison right here. Finally, evaluation for a, a, a potential for aortic stenosis or any stenosis across any valves. You want to get your 2D picture, as we talked about on that um, mechanism. After you have your 2D picture, we're going to align our continuous wave Doppler. So here, uh, this yellow line is representing the continuous wave Doppler signal. And then you would engage that uh, and evaluate the flow acceleration and get your measurements uh, and gradients calculation from that. And here's the table to, again, represent uh, the uh, way of designating uh, the severity of that stenosis. Into uh, the utility of point of ultrasound for the evaluation of uh, cardiac valves.